Good evening, everyone in Europe. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's fun to have you guys here. Well, this is the Watch Party Europe. So Eating Plants is our brand new series. Mick and I are super excited to finally have it out. It's been a bumpy kind of COVID venture, and uh, but we're really thrilled to have it here tonight. It's great to be uh, to great to be sh sharing it with you. Um, my name is Kate Fair. I'm the co-creator, along with my partner Mick McIntyre, of this new series, which really is, shows that is the first of its kind to show a global the global growth of the plant-based movement. Uh, Mick and I have been making films about the environment and people who work hard to protect it for the last 25 years, and uh, this is our first TV series, and we've had such a great time. And uh, two of the fantastic people that we met along the way are here with us tonight. So I just want to introduce them to you now, and uh, they'll be joining us soon for the Q&A after we watch the Eating Plants Germany episode. So welcome Sebastian Joy, who's the founding president of ProVeg International. Uh, he's, uh, which ProVeg is an international food awareness organization working to transform the global food system by replacing conventional animal products with plant-based and cultured alternatives. He also helped kickstart 50by40.org, which is an international, uh, international alliance of over 40 NGOs working to reduce the global consumption of animals by 50% by 2040, where he serves as the executive chair of that. And a special welcome to uh, Sophia Hoffman, who is a fabulous vegan chef. She's a cookbook author and is working on opening her own restaurant at the moment. <laughs> She's published four books in German and her work is recognized internationally. She was invited as a chef to cook the first all vegan, all female dinner at New York's renowned James Beard Foundation. So welcome you to it's so great to have you here and thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Mick and I are really uh, pleased that you're here. You're welcome to stay on and be part of a, the whole evening, which is the Eating Plants Germany, the Q&A, which we'll do for half an hour after that, and then sit back and relax and grab some popcorn or some great snacks and just enjoy a binge watch. So we'll start tonight. Uh, I'm excited to start with Eating Plants Germany. It's six episodes filmed around the world, but as we're in Germany tonight, we thought we'd start with this episode. So enjoy, and we'll see you back here in half an hour. fun to be in, in Germany again. I think uh, that was an unexpected uh, part of this episode and the, this whole series really was that we traveled around the world and got to uh, be in those countries and for so last few years of course no one's been able to travel so uh, thanks for having us in Berlin. <laughs> uh, it's fun to be back. Uh, if you've just joined us, um, Sebastian Joy from ProVeg International and Sylvia Hoffman chef extraordinaire and uh, zero waste extraordinaire person <laughs> so <it was> a <laughs> and we're joined by uh, Mick McIntyre, the co-director. Um, it was so lovely to see the German episode, the uh, boys who uh, were so fabulous, who uh, hosted, agreed to host the series. Their great uh, uh, sense of comedy was really fun and uh, what, what Mick and I really loved about Berlin was just everywhere we went, so many people in Berlin uh, loved to welcome plant-based food, plant-based people, and it just felt like uh, there was such a tip into mainstream, and that's been exciting. Mick, um, we obviously chose a lot of different places. Can you tell me why we, uh, what, can you tell us about the other um, countries that we chose and, and why we chose them? Yeah, look, it was it was uh, an interesting journey, wasn't it? Deciding where to film, um, and I think, I mean, to to put it to put it simply, when you Google top vegan countries in the world, it's a good place to start, and that's exactly what we did. We <laughs> that's how we started the research, and the six countries that we chose came up in the top ten. <laughs> so, um, and then we had the hard task of uh, of 
of you know narrowing it down but that's pretty much how we did it because we knew that if they if the figures were backing it up then we were going to find stories in each of those countries and um, sure enough we did um, that's pretty much how we how we chose the countries um, and uh, yeah yeah, I think in that case, Berlin was uh, in Germany it has been an great, uh, sort of a great initiator of the vegan movement. It's no surprise really that ProBeg International is based there. Um, Sebastian, welcome. And uh, I just wanted to ask you, ask you ProBeg has got this big vision of reducing the global consumption of animals by 50%. How is that working out? And, and how's ProBeg, how does ProBeg work towards that? It's an interesting mm -hmm. idea. Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me, Kate. And yes, yeah, we do have a bold mission, but we are very, yeah, um, very strategic about it and there are a number of approaches that we are taking. I mean, as, as we've said, for example, in the, uh, or in the introduction, when you introduced me, we have created that alliance of, uh, it's called 50 by 40. And actually, in, in your introduction, you said 70, but by now it's actually over 80 organizations all around the world, including groups like Greenpeace or Friends of the Earth and, you know, health associations uh, who are really coming together to get behind that goal of putting down animal meat, con or meat consumption, animal products consumption by 50%. So that is definitely one pillar, you know, getting more organization, more groups behind us to support us in our support. But, uh, but also what you've said, um, what we saw in the incubator, we work a lot with startups. So on the one hand, we really try to create, you know, use entrepreneurship and getting, you know, excited, uh, competent advocates to create new new companies. By now, we have helped create more than 60 startups, which have products that are being sold in 15,000 stores, and they have collectively raised over 230 million dollars to really keep growing international. We had startups from 30 different countries. Um, I mean, one thing, I mean, we are very happy about the progress in Berlin, but we always try to really, you know, have a, have a reach out into the world. So, for example, like with that startup, we have the startups often coming to Berlin, but then they go back to, I don't know, Bolivia, Chile. We even have like a startup now from Ukraine or Russia um, who are then actually really, really pushing pushing veganism forward, developing new products. So that's certainly something we're focusing on. Food innovation. Um, but we're actually also working a lot with big companies, you know, because it's not only the startups, because then they're actually putting the pressure on the big companies. I always say it's a bit like with Tesla, you know, the rise of Tesla is, I mean, that's in and of itself is already very amazing. But the fact that now BMW and Mercedes and all the big players feel pushed to also develop in electric vehicles is kind of like a similar approach that we are taking. So we're also working with companies like Unilever and Nestle and many others of the big players, also like big meat companies. And um, for example, we have worked with many big meat companies to develop more plant-based products. Uh, and actually for this, uh, there's always a big um, trade show for the, the meat industry in Germany. And actually for this year, they have now actually changed it that it's not only for the meat industry, but for the meat and alternative protein industry. So I think that really shows how you can uh, you know, have a real impact. And some of the meat companies we've worked with actually making now more revenue with their plant-based option than with their meat option. So we're kind of like not trying to create enemies, but really working with everybody and saying, look, this is a win-win situation for, uh, for everyone involved. So that's Do you think I that um, they're driven by, I mean, obviously people are driven by different things. Are they driven by ethics or finance or taste? Or what, yes. do, you think, what do you see in, in ProVage is driving that? Well, we, we actually at ProVeg, we, we see ourselves as a multi-problem solver. So sometimes we say we are kind of like the Swiss army knife of NGOs. So we have the, the five pros of ProVeg also like actually incorporated in our vision, which is a world where everyone chooses delicious and healthy food that is good for all humans, animals, and the planet. So the five pros are taste, health, justice, animals, and the environment. So this is why we, and we start actually with health and taste because that's our, yeah, that's often like what people are most afraid about when they hear about you know vegans. Oh my God, these are the ones you know care about animals. Want to take away my my delicious burger? So that's why we start with those two. But really making sure that uh, you know it, it has positive implications on many many fronts. And obviously also when we work with businesses, you know having a like a profit mo motive is 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 quite important. I mean we have been ranked, for example, like we. We just presented at the, the European's largest uh, food service trade show, 
and we always have like a ranking of food service providers. You know, I mean, it sounds a bit fancy, but it's basically chain restaurants like McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Pizza Hut. So we look how many vegan options they have, and we have done it for numbers of years. And then we work with big media outlets in the food industry to actually talk about these ranking. And that's always, um, you know, on the one hand, it's it's motivating for those who are on top. It is it, oh my God, we are like the top one or top, you know, best vegan options. How can we be even better? But obviously, also the ones who are more at the bottom, I don't know, like KFC, for example, like that, or Pizza Hut at the moment, they might be motivated. Oh my God, we we really don't want to stay at the bottom. Can you maybe help us develop more alternatives or or do like that? So that's yeah, yeah. definitely something that we're seeing how you can actually use the comp- competitive force in the industry to uh, you know that it's basically like a race who has more delicious plant-based products. <laughs> I, I'm excited to hear that uh, taste is a big part of it. I think one of the things Mick and I noticed around the world when we were traveling for the series was how excited chefs were getting about food now. Uh, Sophia, you uh, are on the cutting edge of changing food, disrupting food really can you tell us about what you know what that's like and what's it like to be a chef in this space that keeps changing it's uh yeah it's super interesting i mean i i started um working in this in this area like plant based cooking over 10 years ago and uh also if i remember when my first book, book came out in 2014 you know all the press work i was doing it was still so much about does this even taste? You know, I had to prove myself so much. And I think this has changed so much uh, in the public eye. I mean, it's it's global news now that we are in a climate crisis. We have all like people agree that we have to eat less meat, you know, that this is a problem. So and also the the notion that plant based food actually can taste good. Like, I don't feel like I, I think uh, it's way easier these days. And uh, yeah, so much has changed. And I mean, Berlin is in the middle of that and uh, yeah you just mentioned it in the beginning I'm in the process of starting my own restaurant and it's such an interesting uh, uh, hot spot it's such an interesting network also to do these things and also how you've seen in the episode my work is very much connected also to sustainability to um, value of food and and uh, yeah it's just it's just the, the right place to do that the right time to do that and it has become way easier <laughs> yeah, that's to get right. people to, <laughs> to try it, it does, and everything. It does seem like the right time and the right place. I mean, one of the reasons we made the film was because so many people are interested. Either they've got a relative or uh, they've got a health issue or they just want to um, switch some of their diet or all of their diet towards more plant-based. How are you – how are – you know, is, are your cookbooks like helping people? How do people turn their cooking into more vegan cooking? Because I think that that stops a few people. I know my neighbor said to me, I've come back from a great yoga retreat and I had delicious food, but I can't make it for myself at home because I don't know how. How do you think people are learning how to make more plant-based food? So, in, I mean, my, my idea or my method is, and, you know, all – vegan chefs or cookbook authors have like different approaches um, because I also have these other topics. So I have the zero waste topic and I wrote a book in 2020 that is more about intuitive cooking, which a lot of people don't learn so much uh, anymore at home. Um, it's it's a bit funny because I don't put vegan in the first place. Like people that know my work know that everything is plant-based, of course, but I'm also trying to to tackle a bigger audience by just, you know, this zero waste topic for example and I think it's a step-by-step thing you have to put one foot into first step is that you have to want to cook you know I cannot I cannot give you that you have to do that first step but then from there uh, I'm really try trying to to write books for people that can enter at every stage and I'm try, I'm so passionate for uh, making fresh food and I'm just trying to transport this in my work and um, maybe I can mention this for for the people from uh, German speaking countries I'm also super happy because um, next week actually on the 15th of May there's the TV premiere of a new documentary series, a German documentary series in IRD, and it's called Fine Food Stories, and they did a whole episode about my work. And oh, it's great. just, 
very great that for the first episode they choose uh, a female vegan chef. So um, wow. yeah, <laughs> that's so, amazing. That's so okay. it's you know that's a mainstream step, and it's very important that we that we see this more. Yeah, yeah. 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 I I could also just uh, second what what Sophia said. Like we have been. Uh, just to give you an example, like we have been tracking the number of vegan cookbooks at ProVeg, like that were published in Germany. And I think when we started in 2008 or something like that, we had literally three vegan cookbooks in all of Germany that were like <laughs> you could literally find. And then we created like a cookbook of the year award. Well, obviously, you know, we <laughs> focused on the on the meat alternative, uh, you know, the, the vegetarian and vegan cookbooks. But then in the years after that, like it has really exploded and. A few years later, we had to stop because we actually reached over 200 vegan cookbooks that were published <laughs> a year. Like that's like wow. four cookbooks a week that have been published. Great. But the beauty, and that actually, you know, uh, relates to what Sophia has been saying. The initial books were only about vegan, like that was like the main focus. But then everybody makes like, oh, gluten-free or sugar-free cooking or uh, you know, cooking with the Vitamix or you know, or, you know, like all these all these different things. So it's like we're actually targeting more specific uh, you know, demographics that are really interested. And for example, also with the incubator that I just mentioned, some of the products, they don't mention so much that they're you know, like, you know, vegan. They're more like, oh, we are, we are sugar-free or we are using recycled pits from avocados. That's more sustainable. So I think that's actually really like a, a big success factor, you know, staying a bit below the radar, but just infusing the plant-based message in, in everything that uh, you know that can be done, and also with regards to cooking, because um, Sophia said she cannot really you know it's hard to induce people if they actually don't want to cook. One program that we have it's it's called School Plates. Well, it's called School Plates in the UK. It's called Aktion Pflanzenpower, like you know plant-powered pupils in Germany. In, in Germany, and we work actually together with health insurance companies, and we actually go into schools and teach children how to cook. Um, you know, so we, we inspire them and then, you know, they make the first lasagna, you know, bolognese or something like that. And usually, I mean, with kids, if they love, you know, they love to get their hands dirty and, you know, do, do stuff. And once they have cooked it themselves, I mean, they're always going to love it, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I think that and that really inspires them. Oh, and then, then they want to cook more because it's actually often the, the children who then, you know, who are often most excited about a plant based diet and who don't actually uh, you know, influence their influence their parents, and actually that's also something that we have seen, like for what I mentioned earlier, like with the meat industry. I mean, I had executives from the meat industry telling me, well, you know, my daughter, she always shows me these horrific pictures on social media about, you know, what am I supposed to tell her, like what I do for a living? Like we have to change. I mean, and that that's one of the reasons why they're actually, uh, you know, developing plant-based products. So it's interesting yeah. often to see how it's often the younger generation who really pushes these things forward. But then yeah, there's yeah. also like the, the, the older generations that might maybe be more motivated by health. And that's, for example, like we have joined forces with Charité, which is one of the most renowned hospitals in, in Europe, and have created what's called VegMed. And that's like a, you know, one of Europe's largest medical conference where we really work with medical professionals, you know, medical doctors, nutritionists, to really get them excited about the benefits of a plant-based diet. Because, you know, mm -hmm. that usually, you know, nutritional... Um, well, yeah, I mean, nutritional access or, you know, education is not part of the curriculum for medical doctors. So that really makes a big difference. And we also have the Physicians Association for Nutrition now here in Germany and globally. who are working with doctors to basically, you know, what Neil Barnard in the video has been doing in the U.S., like on a, on a global scale to really get the medical community on board. Yeah, yeah. No, we were really surprised. Uh, Sophia, I, yeah. I just I just wanted to add to come back to your original question because also Sebastian mentioned the lasagna, like the original question, how to get people into this step by step. And I think my the the picture I always like to use the picture of a puzzle, so to give them like you know simple recipes like like a vegan bolognese, which is really such a classic, and it's something you can introduce to people who still eat meat. You will you know it's just tasty. It's very simple. It's about the flavors, about the spices or to do like a risotto and then do it with like different seasonal ingredients you know if you if you get more and more of these puzzle parts and if you know how to bake a, a basic vegan cake you know um and you put them all together then you just learn how to to cook for yourself in a vegan way and then it's just super simple and at some point yeah you don't need the egg anymore to make a cake and so on and i think 
that's what I try to provide, these like very basic recipes that give people the freedom to build their own puzzle, their own tasty vegan puzzle, and yeah, just yeah. make it bigger and bigger over time. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, think I, I, I very much agree. I think that's something that still I think can the vegan movement maybe learn to think more in those puzzle pieces. I think often we think mm. more like black and white. Oh, you have to go vegan, and that's sometimes that's a big step because even if there's just one maybe one animal product where the people don't find an alternative, they feel like oh, I cannot do this because I really only like I don't know cow's milk in my coffee. I mean, I personally don't think there's a reason given all the alternatives, but sometimes just getting started because even when people say oh yeah. For the bolognese, that's really like, you know, like replacing that, that's, that's like an easy step, but maybe not for something else. So I think really getting, getting them started on the trajectory so that they actually see and get the positive reinforcement instead of having the frustration that they're not there all the way. So really like highlighting that it, that it's a journey for everyone. I mean, you know, some people go vegan overnight, but for most of the people, it's actually more of a journey. And I think really highlighting that and like saying, you know, oh, which are the products that you can do and, also, like when people ask me if I'm vegan, I usually say, well, I've been eating meat for the first 20 years of my life. And then, you know, I, I shifted and I actually found, you know, it's yeah. easier and easier to incorporate more and more. And now mm -hmm. I am, yes, I am fully vegan, but. I uh, think that Taro quote and everything at the beginning in the episode about, you don't have to say you're vegan or you don't have to say anything. You just can choose a plant-based diet, and then yeah. you're not maybe um, having to make such a big deal out of things. But exactly. Nick, um, tell us a bit about some of the surprises in the film. We, I mean, lots of the things that we've been talking about tonight, we wanted to include in the film. But what were some of the surprises for you of when you were making the film about how, in each country, or you know, from one of the countries? Well, I'll just continue the thread of this conversation to start with, Kate, and that is that I urge, you know, I urge people watching this to continue the journey with us. There's five more episodes and it's wonderful to hear Sophia and Sebastian talk because we do cover a lot of what we just, what we just spoke about for the last 10 minutes. Like we hear people say these exact things in, in different countries. Um, we have an athlete and an elite athlete in Australia talk about how, how she started by just supplementing every meal with a plant-based option. And she's an elite athlete and she found that really simple. She just started with her breakfast cereal. She started with her salad at lunch and then she started with, you know, pasta at dinner. So she talks about supplementing every meal and how simple she found that, you know, it wasn't that complicated. She also talks about how fabulous her, um, her athletic career has gone since she went plant-based. Um, you know, so we do, we do, um, and then we, you know, we step through various processes of what you can buy in supermarkets. You know, it's, it's really simple to, to walk down the aisles of a supermarket and, and buy plant-based now, you know, and we, so, uh, yeah, I urge people to watch the other five episodes because, uh, you know, we're very proud of just how many things we've covered in those, in, in the six episodes because it, we really did want to simplify it. We really did want to make this uh, mainstream, and and I think we've succeeded. And I and the sales we've made to the television networks around the world, um, you know, back up the fact that we have made it mainstream. We we wanted to not make it threatening. We wanted to make it very positive. And you know, hey, who knew that the world would need something so positive? And so this series has come along at a very very good time for the world. And um, Okay, to answer your question, there were lots of surprises. Um, and look, the surprise to us was how we couldn't keep up with the growth. Um, you know, we were scrambling in the edit to, you know, new information was coming through every day about the exciting new, um, uh, you know, the exciting new products or the exciting new breakthroughs, you know, and yeah, it was just it, it just meant that we were riding this wave of, of popularity and growth. Um, I think I, I, just to answer your question, though, probably one of the biggest surprises was what we learned in China. Um, we mentioned this in the Q&A the other day, but China really is a plant based culture. And it's only been in the last sort of 30, 40 years that they've been really eating animal products. And what what surprised me was the 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 increase in the animal product consumption in China correlates exactly with the increase, the graph goes like this, with the increase of the lifestyle diseases that are killing Chinese people, whereas heart disease, diabetes. So it's almost like we have this baseline study 
of what introducing animal products has done to a culture. And that's really interesting. Anyway, you'll learn more about that in the China episode. Um, but yeah, it's, it's amazing that there's so much um, science coming out now um, about the effects of eating animal products and about the benefits of eating plant-based products. Yeah. Yeah, it feels like uh, yeah, to agree. lower if people want to lower their risk of for health, those major health diseases that our Western world is facing, like sunscreen, you would just put it on because <laughs> you don't want to get melanomas maybe that's the same thing if you don't want to get it but sebastian what's what's surprising and what's the most exciting thing happening uh, for you like what what drives you and oh, at the moment? i think so many things but just like also to to add to mick because you know we, we also are active in with probage in china and we actually you know have seen quite also some some re receptiveness so for example like we have a food innovation challenge where we work with universities across china and southeast asia where we actually targeting or working with students to come up with innovative ideas of new plant-based products and there's you know exactly. innovation innovation is a big thing in in china so that's something that has been quite receptive we also actually were joining forces with the uh, with world chefs like it's the uh, you know association of chefs um like the the, the global association had a, had a big conference a culinary summit in hangzhou in china which was really well attended you know to get also the chinese chefs and the culinary societies excited about that and that was also well received so i think there is that definitely a lot that, that can be done. But yes, it's still, there's still a lot to do. And actually, that's maybe also one of the messages here for the audience that, um, you know, because I think it's an exciting time to really enter the movement full time because there are so many opportunities, you know. I mean, when I started like 15 years ago, people were, to, you know, when I said, oh, I want to go into, into, you know, promoting veganism full time, people say, said, oh, Sebastian, you're crazy. You're not going to get paid for promoting veganism. That's something you do on the weekends. Uh, but, you know, as Sophia has shown, as you guys have shown, there are so many possibilities, you know, whether it's become, you know, a social media influencer, becoming a lobbyist, working in Brussels, you know, making movies, uh, documentaries, but also, I, you know, nutritional advice, becoming an entrepreneur, working on a campaign, you know, on the United Nations levels, doing, you know, uh, Annalena that we have seen actually interview, she's, you know, now getting her PhD uh, in, you know, in, in public health about, you know how to uh, you know you know how to, how how plant based is, is thriving and stuff like that. So I think there's so many things you can do. So I really encourage everybody watching here, like you know, if they're maybe just vegan or vegan interested on the side, to really you know take a heart, you know, or you know consider how they can join the movement full time. And you know, at Provich we often have you know job offers, interns offer, or but there are many other amazing organizations. So I think that's definitely something that I would encourage every everybody to do. And besides that, yeah, I mean, to, to your question, I think most excited. I think the level of everything coming together now with also big institutions, like, you know, we have been active at the United Nations Climate Summit uh, for a number of years. And in the beginning, we were kind of like the only organization kind of like, you know, trying to push it. But from year to year, that has really, really grown tremendously. And now we're even getting invited by the Ministry of Environment to speak about the benefits of plant-rich diets. So I think that it's about the big leverage of society, because I think often like vegans, they tend to work like more from a, a bottom-up approach. And I think at the early stage of a movement, that's how you have to do, you know, like you have to, you know, try to convince it more individuals. But at a certain level, when you reach a critical mass as a movement, you also have like the more the top down approach and you can actually work with, you know, the big institutions, whether that's, you know, United Nations or World Economic Forum or, um, you know, WHO and stuff like that. And I think that is that is where there's still a lot of efforts being needed for our movement. So I think that's definitely something that's going to be very exciting in the next years to come. Oh, great. That's I love that you have such a big perspective of it all. That's fantastic. And let's just go down to a smaller perspective. What food are you serving at your restaurant, Sophia? And what's really grabbing your uh, like inspiration right now on food? We only have a short time left, so yeah. So I, I wanted I, I I wanted to add that a small or like that uh, personal perspective from like what every person can do. And I mean, we mentioned it before. I think every step counts. And you know, as we said, I I just wanted to add earlier. I see it so much also in my circle of friends and my families, you know, not everybody might be vegan, but so many people don't drink cow's milk anymore or they eat way less meat. They try all the alternative product. It has 
it has been such a shift in the last years. And um, of course, that's also uh, our goal in the restaurant. We want to make it as sustainable as possible, but of course, uh, um, tasty. Yeah, that's the most important part. And uh, we're going to have an organic certification. That's our value catalog. That's also still very rare in Germany in restaurants. Um, yeah, so we want to push that uh, agenda a little bit and put that together with vegan and sustainability. Oh, good luck with that. that I can't wait to come to Berlin and try it now we can travel. Yep. <laughs> um, and um, Mick, what's happening with the series now? Can you give us a quick roundup of what where people can see it or tell their friends? Yeah, well, it, it's very, it's fantastic to be releasing it to the world this weekend. <laughs> so thanks for thanks for helping us do that. We're having these uh, wonderful online watch parties in different time zones around the world this weekend, which has been fabulous. Um, and for and and as I mentioned earlier, it's been already sold to some um, networks around the world on television. Um, follow follow us on socials, uh, eatingplant.tv to find out more. Um, and what's uh, what we really would like is for people to host their own screenings. Um, and this is a fabulous way for communities to get together and eat some good food and binge watch a series about how to how to be more plant based. And um, it's really simple. We help you through that process. Uh, you can find out more on our website, eatingplants.tv, but we really want people to be hosting their own screenings of the show. So yeah please contact us via eatingplants.tv. Oh, great. So that's so exciting. Look, uh, it's been a quick chat and we probably could talk for another hour, but thank you so much, Sophia. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Now, thank you. We're great. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank, th th thank you for making this happen. I think it's so inspiring to see how, how veganism is growing all around the world. And I guess you can probably add a new country every couple of months. I can, <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. So yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe I don't know, in the few years, probably will be sitting jump. here with like 20 countries to show for. <laughs> right. Well, hey, Kate, just before you go, um, stay tuned on Eating Plants TV because, you know, the success of Series 1 is fast meaning that we're looking at doing series two. So, um, and we'd love people's input on, on where to go. So <laughs> please keep in touch with us. <laughs> we'll do it. Okay, well enjoy Eating Plants America and sit back and relax and enjoy the binge watch the next five episodes. <laughs> Perfect, thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>